Hello and welcome to the next session of Postcolonial Literatures in English. In the next few sessions, we are going to explore uh, this novel, Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Adichie. The novel is set in Nigeria, Africa, uh, published in 2003, and it is, uh, it is an important work of postcolonial literatures in English in the 21st century. So before we go on with the novel itself, a little bit of a background about the author. Chimama, Chimamanda Adeche is a contemporary writer born in 1977 in Nigeria. Uh, her works include Purple Hibiscus, published in 2003, the one which are, we are going to study. Uh, her novel Half a Yellow Sun, published in 2006. Americana 2013 and then a collection of short stories, The Thing Around Your Neck and a very important and interesting essay on, about why we should all be feminists uh, published in 2014. There are also several TED Talks given by the author most promin prominently the TED Talk called Dangers of a Single Story. So if you are, if you, if you like her work and if you want to explore a little bit more about Adichie, her ideas, her literature, the background to her literature, her writing, it might be a good idea to uh, listen to the TED talk, Dangers of a Single Story. It is available on YouTube. So please go ahead. Uh, it is a wonderful talk. Now, before we go on with the novel, a little bit of background about the setting of Purple Hibiscus. It is set in post-colonial Nigeria. Now, uh, if we talk about Nigeria or the uh, African continent at large, uh, its history uh, predates colonialism. Its history predates European colonialism. We often hear of parts of Earth uh, being mapped or discovered by uh, by the Europeans, by the colonialists. However, we, we must remember that these parts of Earth, uh, these parts of Earth, were not waiting to be mapped or discovered. They existed before colonialism. Nigeria, there there is an evidence of pre-colonial settlements since uh, six thousand BC, and the area came under British control only in eighteen sixty one. It formally became a British colony in 1914. However, look at the location of, uh, of this particular area, an area which is uh, geographically very conducive for trade. Uh, if Europe is somewhere over here, the ships would come. It offers, uh, this area would offer natural harbors. It offers na natural harbors. And the trade is not just about goods um, and uh, other, it's not just about goods, but also people, the trade of people or slave trade and slave trade had been prevalent since the 15th century, right? Uh, Atlantic slave trade from Nigeria and the area around, you know, around this part of the continent to Caribbean islands, to the Americas, uh, the, the area, this, this part of the continent has de dealt with the worst of slave trade. So European traders arrived in the region to purchase enslaved Africans as part of Atlantic slave trade. Local merchants provided them with slaves, escalating conflicts among the ethnic groups in the region and uh, disrupting the older trade patterns in the region. However, slave trade was abolished in 1830s and yet uh, the people, uh, people continued to migrate from this part of the continent, from Nigeria and the air area around the country to various parts of the world. Uh, the country attained independence in 1960 and became a republic in 1963. However, as we have seen in most of the colonies, in most of the literature, uh, most of the literature, post-colonial literature in, uh, that we have covered before this, now, the, the, as the colonial administration leaves, the post-colonial, uh, post uh, post the independent nation has to deal with this vacuum of power. Uh, we saw this in Achebe's Man of Power. We see this in various other texts. There is ethnic strife. There is violence. Uh, 
Nigeria dealt with a long ethnic has dealt with long ethnic strife leading to military coups and military <coughs> military groups led, ruled the country from 1966 to 1979 and then from 1983 to 1999 and this is the time the second military coup 1983 to 1999 the book is set during this time and as you will see this political uh, the political upheaval that is going on in the country has a direct has direct repercussions has a direct impact on the private life of the characters that we see apart from the military coups uh, the the country has also uh, dealt with a faced civil war between the federal government and the former eastern region Biafra so Biafran war uh, and if you remember again uh, Sitsi Dagaremgwa's nervous condition uh, was set against this background of the Biafran civil war. Now coming to the ethnic groups, uh, something that would be important to understand the novel. Uh, the novel uses a lot of uh, Igbo uh, language, uh, cultural references. So Igbo is, uh, what is an ethnic community, the community which constitutes the largest ethnic group in that geographical region and its homeland is around Nigeria River. It has a distinct language and culture which predates British colonialism. Now uh, the, the community constitutes of tightly knit quasi-democratic communities. Igbo communities and the area governments were overwhelmingly ruled by a republican consultative assembly of the common people so the communities are usually administered by a council of elders and we see this directly in the in the novel uh, because if you remember uh, the father eugene doesn't like the children his children to meet the grandfather and the grandfather petitions to the council of elders and although the council of elders uh, acknowledges the power of Eugene the father yet it rules that the grand grandchildren cannot be separated from the grandfather and Eugene despite his power despite his wealth has to uh, has to submit to the rule ruling of the uh, community so we see that it is uh, the council of elders is an important uh, organization and does kind of administer to the community and its word is important its rules are important in the community so it is it is uh, it maintains a form of patriarchal lineage which means that uh, it is uh, uh, the culture is moves or uh, continues with the uh, on, on, on in a patrilineal system the male line of descent from the founding ancestor however it is uh, there are other aspects of this uh, culture especially when we consider gender uh, that is that are quite interesting like uh, Amadi Ome uh, mentions that gender and sex did not where gender and sex did not coincide gender is flexible and fluid allow, allowing women to become men that is allowing women to take on male roles and allowing male, male men to take on female roles so uh, so gender categories are fluid so although it is patrilineal it is still there is some amount of openness it has indigenous calendar banking system religion rituals why i mention all these things is to show that it is a fairly advanced uh, culture which has been disrupted or which was disrupted by the arrival of British colonial system. Now with the, with the migration of people from this part, from Igbo culture, Igbo homeland uh, to various parts of the world, to Caribbean, to Americas, uh, either, either as a part of slave trade or a post slave trade migration, the elements of Igbo culture spread uh, spread beyond Africa and we see that uh, we see the elements in Americas in, in Jamaica and so on however it, it did in Nigeria itself as we shall see in the novel it suffers uh, it suffers due to direct impact of colonialism primarily due to Western education arrival of Christian missionaries especially uh, and of course the slave trade 
Now, purple hibiscus is it's it's a building stroman, right? It's a coming of age story, narrated by Kambili Achike, a young girl, and it is it is a story of her coming of age. It's her building stroman, how she grows up from this very young person who is completely under the influence of her father, completely under the not only physical but also under mental uh, mental control you know her, her psychical control the father kind of commands her thoughts her emotions and how she grows up to becoming a person on her own so the setting is of course immediate setting of the story is the Achike family the father mother her brother Jaja and herself a uh, large uh, beyond Achike family we see post-colonial Nigeria that is dealing with the impact of the military coup and this has a direct impact on the family. Uh, Kambili's father is involved with the democratic, you know, the renewed democracy, the democracy, uh, pro, he's pro-democracy. So he's involved with, the, uh, with this resistance against the dictator, the military dictator and he suffers he's he's threatened uh, they face uh, they face the di uh, they face a direct impact of the uh, dictatorship and it leaves a mark on the family so beyond the family uh, beyond the immediate family circle we see the political impact of political uh, setup the political upheaval on the characters and of course uh, the time frame in which it is set in 1980s and uh, 1990s before during uh, and also to some extent after the military coup so coming to the book itself it is divided into four parts right the entire book is divided into four parts and if you see the title of each of these parts uh, breaking gods speaking with our spirits the pieces of gods a different silence now uh, you as you can see it is a very quasi religious discourse here uh, reference to gods spirits and so on so uh, religion constitutes an important very important theme and if you read the first right from the start of the book uh, we see a lot of uh, reference to religion right from the start So look at this, uh, look at this part of the, this is the first paragraph of the book and you can see the prominence, all these, uh, all these words constituting the religious discourse which holds prominence in the, at the start and you will see and we shall see that it, religious constitutes an important theme and this is an important theme because we see a kind of a conflict or a, di uh, yeah, a direct conflict between Christianity uh, brought by Christian missionaries and then the indigenous religion followed by uh, the grandfather Papa Nukfu uh, who uh, comes later on so but with uh, for right from the start we see that religion religion is one of the frameworks right religion is one of the frameworks uh, that that kind of uh, uh, in which the story happens it kind of constitutes a framework of understanding this story and it is it is a very important uh, you know the religious rules religious uh, calendar every uh, every sunday going to the mass so all these frame the life of this family right it is religion is literally uh, the life the family life is lived according to the religious precepts so uh, so the first part right from the first uh, initial part we can see the dominance of religious discourse also important to note things she begins with this phrase things fall the uh, things started to fall apart right things started to fall apart at my at home when my brother jaja did not go to the uh, did not go to communion and papa flung heavy missile across the room and so on so important things to note about this opening first things uh, started to fall apart a direct reference to Chinya Achebe's post-colonial classic, Things Fall Apart, right? And Adeche has mentioned her admiration for Achebe as a Nigerian writer and she uses the phrase from, her, uh, from his post-colonial classic, Things Fall Apart, to begin 
her story, things started to fall apart. Another important thing to notice is that we begin in media rest, right? We begin in the middle of the action. She begins, actually she begins at a very climatic moment of the plot. A moment where we see direct conflict between Papa, the father and Jaja, right? Uh, and Jaja, uh, there, is, there is a kind of disobedience. Jaja did not go to communion. Disobedience, Papa does not like that. So uh, it is not, uh, a dis it's not just a disobedience against religion, but also against the father. So we see the conflict there. We see various uh, players. We see the various actors in that conflict. So Papa and religion on one side and Jaja and his resistance on the other side. And there is also, we see, he flung the heavy missile across the room and broke the figurines and so on. So we see the latent violence that is there, that is just there beneath the surface in this family. They have come back from the church. Jaja did not go to the communion and Papa flings this heavy missile across the room, breaking the figurines. Uh, and these are mamas, uh, the mother's figure, uh, you know, the mother collects these figurines. So, uh, so, the, uh, so there is a so important to notice the latent violence that simmers between this between the mem among the members of these family of this family uh, beneath the surface beneath uh, you know beneath the overall the family it it seems to be quite a perfect family the father mother very obedient children and now there is a when when Jaja disobeys when she he tries to assert himself there is an eruption of violence and of course as i mentioned the predominance of religion in the whole uh, thing now religion is not just uh, it is about it is christian uh, christianity we we hear this this references not just to any religion but a uh, christian uh, christian religion right uh, cross shapes sagging palm fronds arranged in cro uh, sagging cross shapes ash wednesday and so on uh, but this is Christian missionaries, this is Christian religion as practiced or as it has been, it is being practiced in uh, Nigeria. And very important, uh, the church, the scene in the church, what happened in the communion. So it's important to consider the scene in the church uh, during the communion. So Papa always sat, uh, sat in the front pew of the mass. Why do they sit in the front pew? I mean, it is uh, it, it is it is a kind of a, it is an indicator of their importance, the importance of the family, and why are they important? Why is the family important? Uh, if you s go to the next page, we see that they make biggest donations, right? They make biggest donations. They pay cartons of communion wine, and Father Benedict, the priest in the church, talks about it. Uh, talks about it so that everyone knows, right? It is the sermon, the congregation, when the congr uh, there is a sermon going on, Father Benedict mentions uh, Papa's generosity to the church. So in a way we see one, that there is religion, but the religion, there is a, some kind of, there are traces of, of class, right? So they sit on the front pew, they're important members of the church, Father Benedict mentions them they're the first to receive the communion because they're important they're benefactors they are they donate to the church so we see that uh, religion is kind of there is some linkages with the class uh, structure uh, in the place but uh, apart from the class structure there is an import there is another much more it's it, a larger structure and that of colonialism uh, read this description of the priest. Even though Father Benedict had been at St. Agnes for seven years, people still referred to him as our new priest. And why is he new? Because uh, perhaps they would not ha 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 have, perhaps they would not have if he had not been white. He still looked new and that is he's not, he still, ha he has preserved his whiteness, his newness, his Englishness despite seven years in Nigeria. Right? Uh, she, he has preserved his exclusivity as a British, as, as an English, English priest, despite seven years. He has, uh, you know, he has preserved that Englishness and that means that he has not, he's kind of fairly unmarked by Nigeria. Here, literally not tanned by the fierce heat of seven Nigerian harmatans. 
His British nose, look at the emphasis on his Britishness. His British nose was still as pinched and narrow. And notice that she does not say that the straight British nose. She says pinched and narrow as if the physical features refer to his, uh, refer to his narrowness, his mental narrowness, right? So pinched and narrow as it always was. The same nose that had me worried that he did not get enough air uh, when he first came to Inugu. Father Benedict had changed things in the parish such as insisting that the credo and uh, you know all the church sermons and everything is recited in only in Latin. Igbo was not acceptable. So language of the people, the people who come to the church is not acceptable. It is Latin. Latin which is uh, European language, Latin also which is uh, the like, traditional language of the church. But Latin also as something which kind of creates a boundary between who holds an upper hand, who holds an upper position in the church and who is not, who's just, who's, who's at the lower rung of the ladder. So Igbo, he, uh, he allows Igbo songs, he called them native songs and when he said native, his straight lips turned down at the corners to form an inverted U, right? So clearly uh, he looks down on an, uh, the native songs, Igbo language, Igbo people and therefore preserving the exclusivity of Latin language, Christian church and his own Britishness or Englishness, right? And so we see the direct, uh, direct uh, reference, direct impact of colonialism here in, in this British, in this small, uh, sorry, in this small church of St. Agnes. Where the, where the local language is kind of looked down upon, local culture is looked down upon and the language and the culture of the colonizer is preserved in its exclusivity and held on a uh, kind of on a higher scale, on a higher uh, level than the local or native cultures, languages and so on. I think also very important to notice here is uh, Kambili's absolute admiration and dedication, her devotion to the father. She really does admire the father, uh, whether it is his modesty, whether it is his generosity. For Kambili, the father is, is he, there is a kind of a hero worship there, uh, quite, quite evident in Kambili's attitude towards the father. And yet, in this, in this a very religious atmosphere in the family, a close-knit family, we see certain disturbing features. As I outline, as I mentioned earlier on, right at the first part, in the first few lines, there is a latent violence there in the family. And here we see uh, fear. Right? Jaja says that the priest keeps touching my mouth and that makes him uncomfortable and I think it is a very valid on on uh, overall it is a uh, communion is a very it's it's a religious thing it is a sacred thing and yet Jaja feels uncomfortable when the priest touches his mouth and when he says that Kambali uh, you know Kambali watches on with shocked eyes begged him to seal his mouth but he did not look at me Right, there is look at the fear that's there in Kambili's attitude as he see as she hears Jaja. And this is what leads to uh, this this uh, you know this uh, Jaja's refusal to take the communion, his reason for it. This is what leads Papa to get angry, the father to get angry and throw the missile across the room at Jaja and it misses Jaja but breaks the Figurines, and I think these figurines constitute an important symbolism, especially because they are related to Mama. They are often broken, and yet she cleans them up and puts them up again and again. And th uh, just uh, as you read about, uh, read the story, read about the figurines, read about the mother, think about the importance of these small figures. Now here, as I mentioned, there is something distorted about the love that she feels, you know, complete devotion, but there is something distorted about this love. There is, of course, latent violence there. And here it is, when they come back from the church, they share tea, right? 
and the shared tea uh, they, from, 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 from uh, one cup. So uh, the father takes a sip and then passes it around. A love sip he called it because you shared the little, little things you loved with the people you loved. Have a love, love sip he would say and Jaja would go first. And it's hot tea and it burns the lips, it burns the, uh, the tongue and it kind of the tea was always too hot always burn my tongue and if lunch was something peppery my raw tongue suffered so there is there there is some kind of dis it, it the love there is some kind of distorted aspect to this love there is control uh, there is violence and there is a kind of perversity in this in this love that they feel for the father and they feel for each other here again, later on, uh, a reference to why she, the mother and the small figurines that she polishes, she, she collects and she polishes. And I think this, this particular extract is quite telling of the link between mother and the symbolism of the figurines. Uh, this is Kambali narrating the story. Years ago, before I understood, I used to wonder why she polished them each time. I heard sounds from their room like something being banged against the door. So the sound from the parents room, the mother and father inside and she hears sounds like something is being banged, beaten and then the mother would come down and start polishing the figurines. So think about, you know, again, she's kind of, it kind of foreshadows uh, the violent and abusive relationship uh, between the parents and the figurines are kind of symbolic of the mother who would suffer the violence and then come back and polish the figurines and when you know they are the direct uh, when the father throws the missile the figurines break they are the direct they're the first uh, they are the direct they bear the direct impact of his anger just like the mother who constitute const constantly bears the impact of so uh as I said, uh, the novel starts in media res. It starts in the middle of the action. Uh, it is very important. It is a climactic moment. Uh, if there has been a kind of a, there is, has been a power dynamic that has been active in the family where the father controls and hold, uh, holds great amount of power. Uh, everyone fears him, his anger, his abu uh, abuse at his hands. Then this particular moment where she starts is a climatic moment where we see a kind of shift in power uh, with Jaja's rebellion, right? With Jaja's resistance, his disobedience. So Kambili is conscious. It is important. She is. She is. Our, she's the one who's telling the story. We see the action through her. She's an observer, and it is her coming of age story. So it marks a turning point in her. Uh, in the way she sees the family and here she mentions that it's a climatic moment uh, when Jaja does not respond to the juice now uh, having that juice together uh, you know the juice comes from the from Papa's factory and they uh, they have it all together and everyone is expected to give feedback but they are expected to give feedback that would allay Papa's anger right that that Papa would like right so not an honest feedback but the feedback that uh, the father would like so mother and uh, the daughter Kambili both of them praise the wine and uh, they expect she really wants Jaja to say the same right to keep Papa's temper down and this and after Jaja's refusal to take the communion Papa wants this obedience again he wants Jaja to praise uh, you know give his feedback, but not an honest feedback, but the feedback that Papa would like So he insists on Jaja uh, Jaja saying something about the cash in juice and Jaja again refuses that right there are no words in my mouth and Here we see the turning point. There was a shadow clouding Papa's eyes a shadow that had been in Jaja's eyes fear Right. So once Jaja's eyes showed fear, it had. But now it had left Jaja's eyes and entered Papa's. So we see this, and we see this through Kamali's eyes. And she, there is a subtle shift in the power dynamics within the family. What is Papa afraid of? Maybe he's afraid of the rebellion that the son, the son's rebellion, the son's disobedience, the shift in power in the family. 
Also important to note here is uh, Papa's sister, Auntie Ifeoma, says Papa was too much of a colonial product. Uh, colonial product, as we see in his, in his uh, you know, complete dedication to the Christian church, he's more Christian than the priest himself, as if uh, being a converted Christian, being a Nigerian Christian, he has to show extra devotion to prove his Christianness. Uh, similarly, his his complete uh, belief in Western education for his family, as you know, as you shall see, his complete belief in English uh, language. So, uh, Papa Auntie Ifyoma says that Papa was a colonial product, and we see all that in the father and the and his behavior. Also important to note, apart from Jaja's rebellion, is Kabili's absolute fear. Actually, her, her absolute fear, despite her devotion to the father, her reaction to Jaja's rebellion, her fear of Papa's anger is, is almost physical. So her fear is, uh, is kind of physical, right? Despite his love, it is physical fear. She vomits, she's nauseated. And so the prologue, the first very short first part ends with this shift in power. When Papa threw missile at Jaja, it was not just the figurines that came tumbling down. It was everything. Everything, what is that everything? We will get to know as the story moves on, as we get, as we get to know uh, about the incidents. How did the things lead to this particular event? What is this everything? Everything is maybe the dynamics of power, right? The way this family has lived its life till now. It was only now, I was only now realizing it, only just letting myself think it, right? There's certain things that she has not let herself think. What are those things, right? We will get to know. But now she's thinking of those things. Remember, Kamali is telling this story after she's grown up, right? But here she talks about, you know, she's talking about this particular incident where, which marked the turning point in her process of growth. Here is also a reference to the purple hibiscus from where the title of the book is derived. Uh, it is the purple hibiscus have come from Auntie Ifyoma and that is important, that is important. Uh, where has this, uh, if purple hibiscus is a symbol of rebellion, right? Rare, frag uh, rare fragrant with undertones of freedom, uh, right? Uh, with undertones of freedom. Where has this attitude of freedom, where has this attitude of rebellion come from? From Auntie Ifyoma's garden, right? And purple hibiscus is blooming just like Jaja's re rebellion, just like Jaja's sense of freedom, sense of self of freedom to be, to do, right? And then she ends this part with, but my memories did not start at Nasuka. Uh, they started before when all the hibiscuses in our front yard were startlingly red, right? That's where her memory started. The common red hibiscus and then the purple hibiscus coming from Auntie Ifyoma's garden, they're rare, they symbolize freedom and now they're blooming in the garden. So the symbolism of the title is derived from this part, uh, this part. So that is the introduction and also the first part, Breaking Gods, kind of, uh, it's, it's a prologue to the story, right? It's a prologue to the story. Uh, next session, we go on with the next part of the, uh, next part of the novel. So just to sum up the first part, the themes, the themes that are introduced is religion, especially Christian, Christian uh, missionary religion, Christianity, the missionary Christianity, which has a direct impact on the family, the family structure. The, they don't just follow the religion in their public life, but religion is a very uh, family affair as well. Now, this religion is linked with the colonial power. And also, in a way, it is linked to class dynamics here. Also, to re in, uh, reiterate, it's a Bildung's roman. It's a coming of age story. So this and uh, this uh, she begins. Uh, she, uh, sorry, Adiche 
begins in media res she begins in this climatic moment where things started to fall apart uh, this is a climatic moment in the story in the plot in the coming of age narrative uh, the family dynamics are evident in this particular uh, in these particular instances and several other that uh, several others that i have pointed out in the discussion of the chapter so we go on to the uh, to part 2 in the next session if you want to if you want to uh, go over other post colonial texts that i have discussed in this uh, in in on this channel then you can have a look we have done uh, quite a few post colonial texts and other texts some poetry so uh, if you want to have a, if you want to study those if you want a discussion on those you can refer to those channels uh, refer to those sessions. Sorry.